Welcome to the University of Michigan Dentistry Podcast Series, promoting oral health care worldwide. So what are we going to talk about this week? It's basically the combination case. What do we mean when we say combination case? Most typically what we mean is a patient whose treatment requires that they have a maxillary complete denture and a mandibular partial denture. So typically the combination case, when we talk about it generically, we're automatically referring to someone who has a complete denture in one arch and a partial denture in the opposing arch. Does it ever happen that we have a patient that has an upper partial denture and a lower complete denture? Though not common, that situation does rarely occur, but it's very uncommon that a person still has some or significant numbers of maxillary teeth and no lower teeth. Does it happen? Yeah. Commonly, no. So most of our discussion will be around the assumption that the patient in question would need a maxillary complete denture and a mandibular removable partial denture. And the patient we're talking about today has already been through the first stage of treatment in which they received a maxillary immediate placement stay plate, that is a temporary denture that was immediately placed in the upper arch, and that was the topic of last week's presentation. And then in the lower arch, they had a temporary lower partial denture, sometimes called a flipper. So if we see this patient, we would make the presumption that this patient came in with lots of teeth in the maxillary and or mandibular arch bombed out, couldn't be restored, patient didn't have the money. Whatever the combination of reasons were, it was decided that this patient would be treated with an upper immediate placement stay plate and a lower immediate placement temporary flipper or temporary partial denture. So the patient wears this, we do any soft relines or temporary relines as needed. Four to six months of time passes. We've got disease control pretty well taken care of. So the remaining teeth on the lower arch, the teeth here and the teeth here, we presume at this time, if we're going to go forward with making a more definitive appliance, what are some of the things I want to have in my mind that I'm feeling comfortable about with these teeth? Any thoughts? Non-mobile. So one of the thoughts was you'd like to see if you're anticipating using teeth as partial denture abutments, you'd like them to not be mobile or have good periodontal support. What do you suppose is something I look at that overrides even, and that's, I'm not discounting that, that's important. What something else is we're monitoring these patients through the time that they've worn these transitional appliances. And in fact, it's one of the reasons in some cases that we make transitional partials. What are other things I'm looking at with the patient? Yes, the thing that the reason patients would even need this treatment very commonly is the loss of many, if not most, of the teeth that were removed was due to dental caries. And that dental caries didn't come out of nowhere. So when somebody has a significant problem with dental caries, what's the first thing I look at with my patients? What's the first thing I talk about? Diet. Because over and over again, I hear you people say during comp care seminar, when you show these cases where people's teeth are rotted off just about at the gum line, is we're going to stress brushing and flossing. That's well and good, and I'm not against brushing and flossing. But if the patient ingests huge amounts of sugar, especially where they sip on things all day long, so if they say, I only do two Mountain Dew Big Gulps per day, well, if it was one thing, if they just slammed them as fast as they could, and that was it for one, and then nine hours later, they slammed another one, and that was it, the saliva in their mouths would have time to reconfigure itself and turn back into a buffer solution to offer some protection for decalcification of the teeth. But how do most people attack their drug of choice? How do most people do their Big Gulp Mountain Dew? They sip it all day long or they've got lifesavers or Tic Tacs or some other 
sugar-containing product that they're sucking on all day long. And so it's that constant bathing in high sucrose that really will kill anything you try to do. And for as long as you do dentistry, if there's any mistakes I have when I look back on the patients I've treated historically, it's going ahead with some fancier corrective phase work when I didn't truly have the disease control or the diet put to bed. That is, that was still an issue. So because your time in clinic is limited, the normal rule of thumb for most of you in comp care is if you finally get your disease control blessing on Friday, then on Monday you have men to start prepping the three-unit bridge immediately. Because you can see those CEUs dancing in front of your eyes like sugar plum fairies. And nobody, you know, when you start out D3 year, the only thing you know for sure is that it's impossible to get to 1050. It just feels like this unscalable mountain. But amazingly enough, every year seniors seem to make that. So the thing we're looking at here when we're even thinking about moving forward is, yes, we want the teeth periodontally stable. But do we have disease control and what's up with the sugar consumption for the patient? So we sort of look at this pre-existing first generation appliance. And many times when one does a first generation appliance or if the patient comes in already wearing a pre-existing denture and a pre-existing partial and it's been determined that we need to remake them. We need to remake them. Okay, you do your oral exam, you look at things, you fill out your process history form, but what are some of the things you want to ask your patient? What did you think about the aesthetics of your upper denture? Maybe they loved it, maybe they hated it, but can you see that the pre-existing denture gives you some sort of a yardstick or a guideline as to what changes you might like to make for the new denture? Or if the patient says, I liked everything about my old denture aesthetically. It just doesn't stay up very good anymore. And the back teeth have worn a lot. So it feels like it doesn't function so good because the back teeth are worn and it seems like my gums have probably changed so the denture falls out more than it did. But as far as the looks of the teeth go, I'm pretty happy with the way my teeth look. Or they may say, I'm happy with the position of my teeth. They support my lip okay. I like the way the teeth look. But, but in today's society, what do you suppose the most common thing people request relative to their denture teeth on a new denture? I'd like them whiter. I'd like them so white they make an aircraft landing light look dull by comparison. Okay, they don't say that, but when you start showing them the shade guide, you're into the bleach shades. Forget B1. We just had this last week. B1's not even close. I want like 14 shades lighter than B1, and it really looks weird, but they're the people that have to wear them, okay? So when you look at somebody, whether it's a complete denture or a combination case or whatever, Spend some time remembering and garnering from the patient what they like or what they don't like about their pre-existing appliance. Too often I see students take it out, put it over at the back of your cubicle, and never look at it at all. And then suddenly when you go to select teeth or you go to talk about those things, it's like this whole brand new thing out of, out of the blue that you've never even thought about. So also tell your patients to start thinking about that. If they hadn't put much time into it, say, okay, if I start out taking preliminary impressions, I want you to think about what you want your teeth to look like. And have you liked the way your teeth look on this denture? Or talk to your spouse or talk to whomever if you, if you value other people's opinions. Start thinking about that early on. Don't say nothing about it. And then the day that you do jaw relations, it's usually about three minutes to 12 or three minutes to five. You come up and we say, you finally got your jaw relations, you can mount those. Patient's ready to go, I say, did you select teeth? Because now that you got the jaw relations, the next thing is to sort of set teeth. And the patient drives down from Marquette because they're saving so much money they can afford to drive 14 hours one way and spend $200 on gas, so it's a good deal. So the thing is you don't want to have sent the patient home 
and the only other thing you have to do is take shades and molds and now you're calling them up to have them drive back from Jackson or Kalamazoo or wherever because you didn't do that. So start that thought process earlier on. So with the combination case, what do we presume? The one thing that you want to make sure you get done first is if it's an upper denture and a lower partial denture, that you want to make sure that you have your lower partial denture framework completed. Now I understand that in many cases there may be some amount of mouth preparations to do. Mouth preparations may include the making of surveyed crowns. Okay, that's not the purpose of this course. Okay, I assume you know all that from sophomore year. Now that may be a fallacy on my part because there was so much stuff coming at you at that time. It was like drinking from a fire hydrant and you don't have a clue. So you go back to your book and you'll ask your faculty if that's a problem. But we'll figure out a way so that we get the framework made. Because sometimes the students are going to do a combination case, they'll spend a lot of time early on trying to make sure they get the final impression for the upper denture. Now in the whole sequence of things, can you see that you, you got to have the lower partial denture framework back in order to take jaw relations or biting relationships to mount the two casts? And so of the upper and lower arch, it's real critical early on to figure out if you need to do any tooth modifications to make a lower partial denture framework. Okay, go ahead and make the tooth modifications. So if you've got to reshape the lingual surfaces of any of the teeth, if you need to reshape the buccal surfaces of any of the teeth. So where you contemplate having the lingual plate fit around here, where you're going to have your lattice work, if you go ahead and look at where the clasps are going to be. So did the buccal surface of this tooth need any reshaping to allow the clasp to stay low toward the gum line? Ditto over here. Did the buccal surface of the tooth take any reshaping? And so you want to make sure that your tooth modifications have been made so that at the time you go ahead and want to take jaw relationship records, you have a partial denture framework back and you may or may not know. From the time you get your master cast impression, your master cast impression that you're going to make the lower partial denture framework on, have it poured up and have a design cast all made and send this off to the lab. It takes the lab approximately two weeks to get your framework back to you. So if you're dead in the water for two weeks anyway, waiting for the framework to get fabricated, can you see if you're doing a combination case, first make sure you get the arch that needs the partial denture all set to go. Get the master cast done, and send it off. If you've got more time that appointment, after you've got your lower master cast taken, we'll go ahead and take your upper final impression for your upper denture as well. But when in doubt, make sure that you get the master cast for the lower partial taken so that that gets out of the building and it's off to the laboratory having that framework made. Because we're picking our nose for two weeks waiting for that to get done. And during that two-week period, can you see it's real easy for us to get the patient back and get the upper, the maxillary master cast done for the denture. So now we get a situation where we've got the lower partial denture framework is now gotten back. And again, we couldn't even send the cast out for that until we had surveyed a study model, made a determination on which teeth were going to be our primary abutment teeth, decided on where our occlusal rests were going to be, decided whether or not we need indirect retainer rests, and taken a look at the contour of the buccal or labial surfaces of our primary abutment teeth to see that the curvature on them is appropriate. So we made any changes to the teeth that were necessary for the mouth preparation piece, took a nice impression, and got that ready to send off for a framework. So now the framework comes back, we try it in the patient's mouth, make sure the framework fits well. So we say, gee, the framework fits well. And remember, while the framework was being made was a fine time to go ahead and get the maxillary master cast taken with a custom tray, border molded as necessary, use PVS impression material and get a nice master cast of the maxillary, a maxillary arch. So now what we've got basically is what? 
we've got an upper master cast, we've got a lower partial denture framework. So again, and you treat a lot of your patients. If you've got a patient that you're doing a single crown on and the patient is mostly dentate, and you have an upper cast and a lower cast, it's fairly easy just to fit those together because there's enough teeth present on those that you can just see, put the cast where the teeth fit, yeah? So now you come to a denture and there ain't no teeth. So the question then becomes is I've got a nice upper model and I've got a nice lower model with the framework. So the point is how do I fit these two things? How do I orient them to one another to do the rest of what I need to do? Okay, I've got to take jaw relationship records and to take jaw relationship records, we need some sort of a record base. And so what does the record base and the wax occlusal rim accomplish? What we're trying to look at is, okay, let's look at the patient's pre-existing denture. Now for the sake of this discussion, let's say this denture that the patient's worn was an immediate placement transitional denture, worked out okay for the patient, and the patient says, I pretty much like where the teeth are on this. I like the way it supports my lip. So with the new denture that you're going to make me that's going to fit better, I'd like it if the teeth supported my lip about the same and where they were positioned up and down was pretty much all that was the same as my denture was. So how does one accomplish that? On your new master cast, you make a record base, and on the record base, you make a wax occlusal rim. And you may have some numbers floating around in your head for one of the practicals that you had to do last year, okay, for your denture course. Was one of your practicals that you had to make a record base and a wax occlusal rim? So there were these numbers, 22 millimeters in the front and 18 millimeters in the back. That's how tall the rims were from the edge of the record base. So this Incisal edge of the rim to the very edge of the record base in here, about 22 millimeters in the anterior, about 18 millimeters in the posterior. You were told generally that the width of the wax rim was about 8 to 10 millimeters wide in the posterior area and 4 to 6 millimeters wide in the anterior area. So you'd have these wax occlusal rims shaped, and then you bring the wax occlusal rims to the mouth, and then make any adjustments to the wax occlusal rims in the mouth until you take this wax and with a Bunsen burner and that big paint scraper looking device that's got the big handle on it and the big broad blade, you heat that up in your flame and then do any adjusting or melting to this wax to make sure that the labial curvature supports the lips just the same way that the patient's previous denture did that the length of the wax rim relative to the upper lip is just where their teeth were on the previous denture. So you've gotten the fullness and you've gotten the length of the wax rim. So all the wax rim is trying to do is occupy the same place in space that the teeth will later occupy. So you get your wax rims adjusted. What do we do? We put the maxillary wax rim in the patient ask them to moisten their lips and just lightly close their lips together. So what I'd like to see here is that the patient's lip in repose, when they're relaxed, lips lightly touching, breathing through their nose, I'd like to see that their lip seems nicely supported. It doesn't look like it's got three cotton rolls under it and it doesn't look like it's trying to cave in. Okay? Now I understand that's a judgment call. There are some of these things that some of my friends that are, that are operative dentists that are all about how many tenths of a millimeter long is the bevel at the cervical of an amalgam that you can put on with a gingival margin trimmer. So they really like it when they can look at something and make measurements down to a hundredth of a millimeter because there's a degree of comfort in that. If you say we're just going to look at a person's lip and make a judgment on how full we think it is and if it looks okay, there are some people who are obsessive compulsive and have a high need for some number that they can write down somewhere, makes them crazy, makes them nuts. Because they can get all over that 2218, but now ask them to just put that in, do a right brain thing where you're just looking at the patient's face as a whole and say, does that look generally okay? Well, how many millimeters is it? 
I don't care. Look at the patient's face. Yeah, but give me some numbers. It's like, get over it, okay? So when they say the art and science of dentistry, a lot of it is science, but there are certain aspects of dentistry that we do that are subjective. And so for some people that are really made crazy by subjectivity, this is sort of a frustrating exercise many times. Because there's no one hard, fast rule I'm going to give you. In general, if the wax rims are 22 millimeters tall here and 18 here, is that going to be pretty close? It is. How are you going to fine tune that? You're going to put the wax rims in the patient's mouth. You're going to have them moisten lips, get their face sideways to you so you can see them in profile. And you're going to ask yourself, does their lip come downward and forward just a little bit from the base of the nose? So when I look right here and start at the base of a person's nose, right there, okay, does that upper lip where the filter is tend to just lightly come out, just forward a little bit? That's what we're looking for, okay? So you go ahead and you do your adjustments as necessary on your maxillary wax occlusal rim. And in this situation, because if you're doing a combination case, the presumption is that there are some lower teeth present. So even if you don't have wax occlusal rims, or if you don't have your partial denture framework tried in, because there are some natural lower teeth, then the natural lower teeth themselves will come up and bite into the wax occlusal rim. And so you can get a, an estimation on occlusal vertical dimension. So the OVD, what should the chin nose distance be? Okay, you work that with your faculty and you work that out. What I usually use is freeway space, just a little freeway space of two to three millimeters. So from physiologic rest position, that the patient can close their lower jaw two to three millimeters and then they have tooth contact or their teeth contact the wax occlusal rim. How do I find physiologic rest position in most patients? What I like to do is support their upper lip. So after I do my adjustment on my wax rim, I put the wax rim in many times. How many of you have worked on dentures so far of, of any kind? Okay, so how many of you have had when you try your maxillary record base in? You put in your upper record base with the wax occlusal rim on it. You put it in the patient's mouth and you take your hand away and the record base beats your hand out of the mouth. But you have that, it falls down immediately. So you're trying to figure things out and you put it in and the second you take your finger away, it drops down. So you're saying, how in the Sam heck am I supposed to get biting relations when the record base won't stay there? So how do you suppose we fix that? Take a lag bolt and put it up into the vomer? And just like, it stays up real good then. You've got to anesthetize the patient first, but it stays there real good. So, no, that's not it. Out at the desk, they have this stuff called denture adhesive powder. So you go out at the desk, and in one of these little translucent cups that looks like a shot glass or a medicine cup, they give you some denture adhesive powder. So what you do is you take the maxillary record base, and you get it moist on the inside. Take your air water spray and just spray the inside of it with an air water spray so it's damp all over. And then sprinkle some of this powder into that like you were putting powdered sugar on a bunt cake or something. Seat that in the patient's mouth real firmly, hold it in the center of the roof of their mouth for three to four seconds, and that adhesive stuff will keep the upper record base stuck up there. So you literally glue it in. And that's okay. What do you suppose the patient's first words to you are when you glue in the record base? Is my denture going to fit any better than this? I mean, this thing fits like socks on a rooster. I don't know that I'm that excited about that. And you always assure your patient that the final denture will fit more intimately and more snugly than the record base does. How come? You remember blocking out your master cast when you made your record base so you didn't abrade it? So you didn't put block out everywhere, but you put some block out wax on the rugae areas. You put it in the undercut. So as you made your record base and took it off and on the cast, you didn't abrade or break the model. So when they make the for real denture, to get the cast of finished denture off the model, they destroy and they disintegrate the model. They break the model away. 
Okay, so now the denture will go in the mouth and it'll fit into some of those undercuts because soft tissues give a little bit, unlike the stone cast. Okay? So we go ahead and we glue the maxillary record base in with the wax occlusal rim after we've adjusted it so we think it's pretty good. And I ask the patients now, please moisten your lips. Open and bring your lips down till they just comfortably touch together. And I have them do that two or three times. And I want them to just let their lips relax together, have them breathe through their nose. What am I looking for? I'm looking for the fact that, A, they can get their lips together. So let's say for the sake of argument, I ask them to do that and they... They're sort of stretching their lips like a guppy or something, like a fish. Okay, what do you suppose that would be indicative of? The wax is touching too quick, and their teeth are already in contact with the wax rim, but their lips ain't together yet. Make sense? So what do we do? We cut more wax away. We cut more wax away. Until they can come down to where they moisten their lips, open, come together, now what I will usually do in some courses or in some textbooks, they make a big deal about having you make dots with an ink pen on the patient's upper lip and the chin and hold a ruler or a bowley gauge or something on there to measure the distance between the dots. And then you have one measurement at physiologic rest and another measurement at contact vertical dimension. And the whole idea is you want contact vertical dimension to be two or three millimeters more closed than physiologic rest positions. Does that make sense for people? So when a person's breathing through their nose with their lips together and their face is completely relaxed, their teeth should be almost but not quite touching. You all clear on that? Almost but not quite touching. Now what I usually do just to see what that distance is, is I don't bother trying to send my patients home looking like they've got a giant blackhead on their upper lip and their chin, okay? What I will usually do is just have them go through that motion, moisten lips, open and bring their lips together. And then if I just take the heel of my hand and set it on their sternum and take my thumb and just have my thumb ever so lightly just touch against the inferior edge of their chin when they're at physiologic rest. And then I just say, would you close? Uh, in the back, it may be too little for you to see. The whole idea is that their chin moves away from my thumb by about an eighth of an inch, give or take. Can you see that's accomplishing the same thing? I'm trying to get this distance of about an eighth of an inch difference between physiologic rest and contact vertical dimension. Whether you get it with a ruler or a bowling gauge or a set of dividers or by holding your thumb by their chin and asking them to close, I could care less. So you contour the maxillary wax occlusal rim. You take a look at how the teeth touch together. And here we've got our patient smiling. So one of the things we see when the patient smiles a little bit, how much of the maxillary wax rim does he display? How much lower tooth does he display? Now, Dr. Jan and I, he's up in the Three Blue Clinic. I love to get his goat every time I can on this. Some faculty feel that you need to put, well, you do need to put temporary bases on the back of your partial denture framework and some sort of an occlusal rim in order to take jaw relationship records, to get a bite. If I'm going to take a bite and I've got my upper wax rim done on my upper record base and I've got a lower partial denture framework, the idea is I need some sort of an occlusal rim hooked onto my lower partial denture framework to take an occlusal registration. Now some faculty feel very strongly that this needs to be made out of triad material and then put wax up on top of that. I'm completely and totally comfortable if you just make it out of blue bite. So I just sign people for some blue bite. What one does is one you'll notice here takes the framework off the model and you grease the edentulous ridges here with some Vaseline. Or in the back, you'll see that triad model release agent, which is essentially white Vaseline 
but because they, they package it and call it triad model release agent, they move the decimal point one place to the right. <laughs> the second anything becomes dental, it's just plain old Vaseline. But instead of 79 cents a tube, it's $7.90 a tube now because it's a dental product. So anyway, you just take some Vaseline or some triad model release agent, grease the edentulous ridges, squirt some triad on both sides, and then very, I'm not sorry, triad, blue bite. Squirt some blue bite on both sides very quickly, seat your framework. So when you seat your framework, the blue bite that was on here squishes up through the lattice work or squishes up through the mesh work. And then very quickly squirt more blue bite on top, just arbitrarily stacking it up in the air till if anything, it's taller than you need and wider than you need. You just gun a whole bunch of blue bite on the back of your partial denture framework. And then let it set up. And after it's set up, you can just take a number 11 blade or a red-handled knife with a 25 blade and then just proceed to take your scalpel and just cut and shape this blue bite material until you make it the same shape that you would like your wax occlusal rim to be. This just happens to be a blue bite occlusal rim and record base all rolled up into one. Works very easily, and you can do that on your uh, master cast once your framework comes back. So now you've got your temporary bases and your occlusal rim. So here you go. Upper record base with wax occlusal rim adjusted, little indentations where the teeth go into the wax occlusal rim. Lower partial denture framework with temporary bases slash occlusal rims made out of blue bite on them. So that's what you need to have ready prior to the patient darkening the door for the jaw relationship appointment. Now some faculty will say, don't bother to make these temporary bases on here until you've tried the framework in the mouth. So if when you try the framework in the mouth, it seems that it doesn't seat very well or there's some interference, you're not confused as to are these causing it not to seat. So if you try the framework in the mouth with nothing on it and make sure the framework seats okay, it only takes a couple of minutes to make these, so that's not a big issue. Whether they're done ahead of time or whether you try the, pa the, the framework in the patient's mouth, make sure the framework fits and then go ahead and fabricate your temporary bases slash occlusal rims. So you try these things in the patient's mouth. We've got things going in. We're going to take a face bow, okay, if you take your maxillary wax occlusal rim and you cut some little grooves on it. Now, in this particular case, it's easier to use blue bite for this. In this case, we used pink base plate wax, but I think it's better demonstrated on this temporary model that we used. If you've got your maxillary bite fork, you put a little PVS adhesive on it, so some PVS adhesive goes on the bite fork, Squirt a little bit of blue bite all the way around your bite fork, and then either the, the cast that you have, the upper cast, can be pressed into that blue bite, leaving the indentations of the teeth in the blue bite material. Or I hope people can picture in their minds, if you've got a record base with a wax occlusal rim, you could set your wax occlusal rim into this. So for taking your face bow transfer, it's very easy when you do the blue bite on the bite fork, just a little bit of blue bite on the bite fork, retained with some PVS adhesive, and I've shown a dentate cast sitting on here. Can you see that we could also just take here, if you've got your maxillary wax occlusal rim all adjusted, the maxillary wax occlusal rim could just get squished down into that blue bite as well. So we take our face bow transfer. In this case, we take the clamp assembly. We hook the clamp assembly onto the C-clamp, and we mount the maxillary master cast into the confines of the articulator. The other thing we want to do anytime we're taking jaw relationship records, maxillary wax occlusal rim has been adjusted just about the way we want it. We check our lower occlusal rim in the back, and what we always want to do is make sure that we cut the occlusal surface of the lower rim back a little bit so that there is some small space. We want to see daylight between the posterior part of the occlusal rim 
and the upper rim. So what are we going to do? We're going to squirt some more blue bite into that space, have the patient bite together on it. So what we're going to do is we've made grooves or we've cut little grooves in the maxillary wax occlusal rim. We just pick those up on our bite registration material. So now we have our clamp assembly for the face bow transfer. We have our wax occlusal rim and we have a bite registration. So what we can do is go ahead and using the transfer assembly and our clamp, we get the maxillary master cast mounted in the articulator. We get that tacked on. We go ahead and take our partial denture framework with the occlusal rim and the bite on that. Mount the lower cast to the already mounted upper cast. And these are the older style, the quote, old fashioned articulators we used for this one. On your newer handout wide view articulators, when you go to mount casts, the newer ones that you are issued will stand on their head just fine. You flip them upside down, they sit there just great. If you've got one of these old fashioned articulators, when you try to turn them upside down and stand them on their head, they don't stand on their head so good. They wobble all over. So sometimes back in the lab, I see people with about 43 paper towels and match boxes and everything else trying to stabilize these things. If you'll notice in each of the labs on the side of the lab that's a little closer to the green clinic, there's this little cable that bolts these certain objects we have in there to the handles of those cabinets up above. There's this little stand there, this little aluminum stand that looks like this funny thing. What's this for? Hmm. Put that on the table and turn one of these articulators upside down. And this little thing down here may look familiar because this little thing right here is what's got a hole in it and it's cabled to the handle of the doors on the upper cabinets. So if you have one of these, quote, old-fashioned articulators, these were the new ones when I was in school. Actually, this is one generation past when I was in school. So anyway, these things, if you've got a mount of lower cast, back in the lab is going to be one of these little things that will allow the articulator to stand on its head very nicely on that. Mount the lower cast, smooth them up and make them look pretty, okay? And now you're all set to start setting teeth. Again, when you get the, the case all mounted, we're going to assume that at this time you had some conversation with your patient about which teeth you needed to select, and the teeth were selected. Now, for the more definitive appliances, the teeth that you pick come from the portrait booklet, okay? The temporary ones came basically from this classic booklet that was for both new hue teeth and classic teeth, and we used the classic teeth. This is for temporary appliances or flippers. When you do the definitive appliance, it's this booklet that you want to pick your teeth from, okay? And inside the booklet, are the various teeth and then once you've picked the anterior mold if you just go to this one page in the booklet it will tell you which size of a zero degree tooth and which size of a ten degree tooth goes with various molds so your anterior teeth will be out here and you just follow across and see which zero degree tooth goes with it and which ten degree tooth goes with it so again, for our purposes, we tend to set 10 degree or anatoline teeth for the upper arch. We tend to set zero degree teeth for the lower arch, okay? And you'll go ahead and select your teeth. So then we set the teeth up. We're going to do the same thing like any denture. We're going to set the teeth and go ahead and set the teeth on the partial. As happens many times with some of these, depending on how much space is left available, there was some drifting anteriorly of the cuspid on this side. So for a normal size looking tooth, you may notice we've only got three incisors in that lower anterior region. So what you want to do with partial dentures is look at where the natural teeth are, look at how much space you have left in which to set your replacement teeth. Now if we were to try to pick a really narrow mold of anterior teeth, really skinny, just so we could put four teeth in there to please our sense of numbers, can you see that if you could get four teeth in there, they'd be awful skinny? And if you just glanced at that person, the teeth would not look proportional for the person. So one tooth more or less in the lower anterior is not noticeable as long as the teeth are of an appropriate size, a good proportion. 
So we set basically the teeth up on the lower partial. We get the teeth set up on the upper denture. There's a little bit of a space right here in what was done after this case was delivered. We came back and with some composite, we just basically etched the incisal edge of that tooth and built the, the cusp just a little bit taller. And it got rid of that space that you see. So the space that's noticed right there was eliminated by just a little bit of recontouring of the incisal edge of that tooth with some composite. But we have the patient in for the full try-in. <clears throat> Pardon me. Have them go through smiling, phonetics, whatnot. And basically this came out so the patient was very happy with it. You've been listening to a production of the University of Michigan School of Dentistry. For more information about Michigan Dentistry, visit us on the web at www.dent.umich.edu.